Good afternoon and welcome to another webinar of uh, the America Europe Chair on Technology, Innovation and International Regulation. My name is Joana Gomes Beron and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Before we begin, just a few words about the Chair. The America Europe Chair on Technology, Innovation and International Regulation is an interdisciplinary initiative of the America Europe Fund hosted at KU Leuven. It aims to bring together expertise in order to examine and compare regulatory developments relating to technology and innovation in Europe and in the United States. Today, we are fortunate to have Professor Alice Dear Young, Professor Stefan Frolik, and Dr. Haluka Cesnartoni for an interesting discussion on the latest meeting of the EU US Trade and Technology Council, which took place on the 31st of May in Sweden. This was the fourth meeting of the US TTC, a forum announced in June 2021 to deepen transatlantic cooperation based on shared democratic values, as well as coordinate approaches to key trade and technology issues. Our esteemed panelists will discuss what progress was achieved in this meeting and how the TTC is shaping transatlantic cooperation. So our first speaker, Professor Elizir Young, is Professor and Neil uh, Family Chair at the Georgia Institute of Technology, where he co-directs the Center for European and Transatlantic Studies, as well as the Center for International Strategy, Technology and Policy. Our second speaker, Professor uh, Stefan Frolik, is Professor of International Relations and Political Economy at the Friedrich Alexander University, Elegant at uh, Nuremberg. And he also teaches at the College of Europe and at the Center for European Integration Studies in Bonn. Uh, our third speaker, Dr. Haluka Cesnartoni, is a research fellow at, the, at Carnegie uh, Europe, where she specializes on European security and defense with a focus on emerging and disruptive technologies. And she's also a guest speaker on European security and defense at the Brussels School of Governance. So thank you very much for our three speakers uh, for joining us today. Before I uh, kick off the discussion, I'd just like to, net, to let our audience know that they can ask questions for our speakers using the Q&A tool at the bottom of the screen. And uh, we will go through uh, these questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, now I'd like to kick off the discussion by asking each of our uh, speakers what were for you the main takeaways from the fourth uh, TTC meeting. And perhaps let's start with uh, Alice Deer for the US perspective and then go to Stefan and Haluka for the European perspective. Great, thank you very much. Good morning from Astronomy Atlanta. Thank you, Joanna, for inviting me and for organizing this event. Um, thank you to the other participants for accommodating my schedule. And apologize, apologies to all of you for causing this event to be late longer after the fact than had originally been intended. Um, so my perspective is going to be from the United States, but not necessarily that of the United States government. And I'm, I'm going to kind of put the... With, TTC and the fourth meetings have been a larger perspective. And the thing is that there are four features of the TTC process, some of which became clearer at the fourth meeting that particularly strike me. The one, and this is sort of viewed in the context of post-Cold War transatlantic regulatory cooperation. So the first one is the high level of political engagement. And we have this meeting, the fourth meeting where we have the Secretaries of State and Commerce and the United States Trade Representative, as well as the, the Commissioners for Trade and Competition. That's a really heavy hitting lineup, right? There's busy people with a lot of responsibility spending a lot of time together on this issue, which signals strong political commitment to the process by both sides, and thus conveys to officials in both jurisdictions that progress is desirable. Such political commitment was lacking during much of the initial post Cold War transatlantic regulatory cooperation, and even during the transatlantic trade and investment partnership negotiations, high level of political engagement was much narrower and focused on trade representatives. The second striking feature is, as Joanna alluded to, is the emphasis on what the US and the EU have in common rather than their differences. The various frameworks during, pursued under the new transatlantic agenda, the 1998 Transatlantic Economic Partnership, and the 2000 Transatlantic Economic mm -hmm. Council and the failed TTIP negotiations focused on mitigating the adverse effects of different rules on transatlantic economic exchange. These efforts yielded few results. Where progress was made, the initiatives were outside this formal framework. 
And so you have the Safe Harbor and Privacy Shield agreements, you have the 2011 Aviation Safety Agreement, the 2017 Agreement between the Food and Drug Administration and the European Medicines Agency on Mutual Acceptance of Certification of Good Manufacturing Practices for Pharmaceuticals. The TTC reflects this reality by leaving dispute resolution outside the agenda. Although the EU, EU and the US are happy to allocate it credit for extending the Good Manufacturing Practices Mutual Recognition Agreement to include veterinary medicines, and updating the long-standing marine equipment mutual recognition agreement, um, both which were assigned to the TTC yeah. in the fourth week. So the TTC's most significant progress to date has been focused in areas where officials on each side share concerns. Now, with respect to investment screening, with the US sharing information on how the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US works, with export controls where cooperation was facilitated by and facilitated coordination of sanctions on Russia and the international, with respect to international technology standards with an agreement on sharing information to contain Chinese influence and international standard setting problems. The first two of those areas were places where cooperation was quite well developed when the TTC was launched. The third emerged as an area of heightened shared concern during late 2021. And Progress has been limited to what both sides are comfortable with, coordination and information sharing. At the fourth meeting, we began to see progress on some of those issues that were much less developed when the TTC was launched. Right? And so part of what it was doing was some information sharing. We began to see some progress on those newer areas at the fourth meeting. And this feeds into the third striking feature of the TTC process, which is a real focus on, on coordination with respect to future needs. Talk of agreeing standards for emerging technology has been an enduring feature of transatlantic regulatory cooperation from the outset, but was very much the exception and not the rule. The rhetoric of setting global rules during the TTIP negotiations was never matched by the reality of the negotiations. The fourth meeting of the TTC, however, reflected some real, if limited, progress on establishing common ground with sort of the big technological concern at the moment was regulating artificial intelligence. We have the announcement that under the joint roadmap on the evaluation and measurement of tools for trustworthy AI launched in December, the TTC has not improved its naming of activities. They created three expert working groups, one on AI terminology and technology, on taxonomy, which announced agreements on 65 terms considered key to understanding the risk-based approach to AI. The second expert group is on the cooperation on AI standards and tools for trustworthy AI and risk management, which is mapping each side's uh, AI standard setting activities to identify areas of common ground. And the third on monitoring and measuring existing and emerging AI risks, where the fourth um, TTC meeting added generative AI to the roadmaps we met. And, and the aim is to build upon progress that's already been achieved in the OECD to develop a joint proposal for a voluntary code of conduct to feed into the G7's discussions. Again, the emphasis on, is on identifying what the US and the EU agree on, not trying to resolve differences. So such efforts will not go far beyond establishing a we will not go far in establishing a common approach. The best that will be realized will be some baseline beyond which both sides are already moving. The fourth striking feature is that while previous transatlantic regulatory cooperation is focused on the transatlantic relationship, the TTC is outward looking. The aspect of this new perspective that has received the most attention has been on the way that has been on the TTC as a way of coordinating the transatlantic response to China's technological rise. How explicit to be about that was apparently a key tension at the fourth meeting. The fault line here, however, does not run through the Atlantic, but through Europe. The commission position in particular has come to look quite a lot like that of the US. I've heard some in the commission contend that the Biden administration's adoption of de-risking as a descriptor rather than decoupling indicates that the US position has moved toward the EU's but if one looks at substance rather than semantics, the commission has moved towards the US position on China. The issue is that a number of member states, including Hungary and France, do not support such a hard line on China, 
and Germany's policy on China is currently a source of considerable internal disagreement. The second aspect of the outward orientation of the TTC, which has not received as much attention, but which is very much in evidence in the fourth meeting, is how the TTC agenda is seen as feeding into wider agendas, particularly that of the G7. It's almost as if the TTC is becoming a forum for transatlantic agenda setting for the G7. My sense is that this reflects the greater importance of G7 as a group of generally like-minded governments, which has been underlined by the response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and shared concerns about China's greater assertiveness. It may also be that the G7 has become more valuable in the wake of Brexit, as the UK is no longer encompassed by EU-US cooperation, but is captured by the G7. So the TTC, in addition to being more outward looking than previous transatlantic cooperation in terms of the problems it seeks to address, is more is also more explicitly open to engaging with others. So what to take away from this? Well, I would argue that the TTC marks a sharp departure from previous transatlantic regulatory cooperation in terms of the substantive focus on what the US and the EU have in common rather than what separates them, its outward orientation being motivated by a concern about non-state economies, especially China's, and actively engaging with like-minded governments. The emphasis on cooperating where the US and the EU preferences are in alignment, or at least compatible, means that the TTC is less ambitious than previous efforts at transatlantic regulatory cooperation, and there is a lot that it will not do. But there it has been some meaningful progress, not least because of the clear, clear political commitment of both parties process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashley dear. Um, going to Stefan now, what would you like to highlight uh, from, from the outcomes of this meeting and uh, from how it's shaping transatlantic cooperation? Yes, uh, first of all, hello to everybody. <clears throat> and uh, thanks for inviting me, Joanna, to, to this webinar, to this meeting. Uh, happy to be with you. Um, now, you will. it will not surprise you, of course, that uh, there will be some similarities with what Alistair has already uh, said, of course. Um, I, 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 I don't think that I really look at it from a you know, particular European angle or perspective, but uh, um, what I will try to do is really look at it you know, from the transatlantic perspective, uh, meaning where are the differences uh, still the most striking differences where 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 do we you know agree and uh, that's it uh, let me let me start with um first general observation i think <clears throat> it has been slightly um, mentioned by alistair already um, that uh, the trade relationship between the eu and the us uh, um, in in the past used to hinge pretty much uh, on, on, on issues uh, during the TTIP negotiations under the Obama administration. Uh, uh, you all uh, are familiar with that and it will ring a bell. I mean, things like uh, chlorine chicken and uh, labels for whatever, uh, um, food standards and so forth, regulatory questions, of course, um, but um, but uh, I think what what the big difference is uh, compared to the situation now is that the focus now is way more existential uh, in, in 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 many ways, um, uh, and uh, I I don't think that uh, things have become easier, despite the fact, of course, that after. The Trump administration, of course, uh, there were great expectations throughout Europe uh, with regard to the, the new uh, administration. And as a matter of fact, I think we are pretty much on the same page, let me put it this way, uh, on, on various issues um, with regard to, you know, the most pressing challenges. Uh, and uh, so nevertheless, I, I don't know whether this will make it easier for us to solve the problems. Uh, uh, lying before us. Um, I think that uh, some of the issues we need to discuss in these days could make trade disputes even more difficult uh, to, to resolve uh, uh, and, uh, as issues like climate change uh, um, and, and, and tech will, uh, will grow more intertwined, of course, with, with trade, uh, making, making cooperation way more challenging, uh, I think, 
uh, as each side competes with maybe to a certain extent still outdated rule books, let me put it this way. Um, um, nevertheless, uh, I think we have every reason to be optimistic, um, as Alistair also said, because as I said, we're pretty much on the same page with regard to the challenges. And I think particularly Europe, or the European Union, and that's in that uh, sense, in that context, I really mean the EU. That means the commission, which has become very much a driver. Uh, um, Alistair was mentioning, of course, still the disputes uh, and uh, disagreements um, between France and Germany on certain issues, how to address IRA, for instance, uh, as a matter of fact, and of course, various other states, um, uh, member states uh, throughout the European Union. But at least we agree on, on the issues. What are the issues that have been mentioned, or we'll come to them later, I think. Um, Recent global ch supply, ch supply change, that's one issue. Um, massive investments pouring into climate change efforts in these days on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, new technologies like uh, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, next generation 6G communication uh, networks, uh, which somehow threaten to up and how economies and governments, of course, in these days function. Um, sanctions coordination, in the case of Russia, um, investment screening, uh, addressing emerging technologies such as quantum and so forth, all being issues, all issues being addressed, of course, also by the first uh, uh, TTC meeting. Uh, but what I think is extremely important and relevant, I think that's, uh, it was Alistair's, I think, fourth feature, and I think it's the most prominent uh, uh, issue, if, uh, and that brings me to my to, to, to China. Running beneath it all actually is a growing anxiety uh, uh, um, and uh, over competition from China. Uh, and I think that finally it has also reached uh, Europe, uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, and um, also political Berlin. Um, and, and increasing focus in both the EU and the US on, on, on propping up, I think, domestic industries. That's also very important. Industrial policy all of a sudden plays a more prominent role, even in my country, um, instead of encouraging global imports. That's, I think, very, very important. And that's close related to what Alice has said or mentioned as the more outward looking approach of TTC. I think that's extremely relevant that way more than previous efforts aimed at increasing, let's say, uh, commerce between uh, the US and the EU, uh, whose uh, 27 member states, of course, are nations uh, negotiating, negotiating or negotiating trade as a, as a single block. Uh, so that includes more discussion on how our Europeans and Americans, the two sides, actually can cooperate on the standards and regulation of technologies and industries that will be central to, to future economic growth and uh, particular to our green energy revolution. So um, uh, these are the issues and that is uh, the new perspective. Um, again, whether all this um, makes things easier, I, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, even under the new administration, the current administration in the US, rather than return to the traditional, let's say, given take uh, of, of tariff negotiations, uh, uh, this administration um, has embraced, uh, how can you say, maybe a more worker-centered trade policy, industrial policy, uh, um, pretty much what European, the EU is also under von der Leyen, the new commission president, of course, is also uh, pressing for. Um, and, and here, of course, there are still some obstacles to be have to be overcome uh, by in in the member states who not all of, of course agree uh, with uh, with this uh, let's say new assertiveness um, uh, a pendulum uh, in from the French perspective making the whole uh, you know macroeconomic stains uh, throughout the European Union maybe uh, swing back swing more into the direction of France and, 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 and into the direction of Germany's traditional order liberal stains on all these issues. So things are changing uh, 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 quite a lot uh, also in this country. Um, and instead of pushing trade partners to adopt digital regulations uh, more amenable to US tech companies uh, or open their markets to more US uh, uh, investment, it's uh, the current administration, I think, is heavily focused also on raising foreign labor and environmental standards to level the playing field for US workers. 
So that will not make things as we've seen over the dispute of, on the IRA, uh, things easier. Um, so far, actually, we've um, more or less overcome these tensions and uh, I think we're on, on a good track, but uh, I think uh, nevertheless, uh, there's quite a lot of work to, to, to do for us. That's all happening without offering uh, the reward of greater access to America's lucrative, lucrative let's say, consumer market for, for fear of political repercussion, repercussions. Uh, and um, so this, I think, is the current background uh, in, 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 these, in these days. Um, and uh, I'll leave it as with, with that because I think we want to go into the more detail I was, you know, with the concrete proposals in, a, in, the, in the second round. And so let me stop here and uh, pass over and back to you, Joanna. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Ruluka, same question to you, your main takeaways from the, from the fourth KPC meeting. Thank you very much, uh, Joanna, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, good morning or good afternoon uh, and greetings from uh, Brussels. Um, following the excellent speakers before me, the, my fellow panelists, it's really a difficult task now because uh, all the points that I wanted to raise have been covered. So I'll try to um, have a more broader approach uh, in terms of the geopolitical dynamics surrounding the TTC, but also potentially go into some key, uh, key three uh, critical areas related to emerging technologies that um, are found as striking uh, following the meeting, ministerial meeting in Sweden. So first of all, in terms of the format of the TTC, of course, it is um, um, a consultative body and actually the value added of the TTC is in the fact that it is a consultative body and to facilitate this greater transatlantic coordination on key issues, but also in terms of establishing trust. Uh, and I think that that's one uh, key important um, um, aspect as well in terms of moving beyond the economic um, uh, you know, backbone relationships be, uh, between the US uh, and the EU, but actually in having um, this forum of socializing and exchanging the views, um, the TTC as a consultative body um, is the best way forward. And I strongly believe uh, that it has become a critical forum for continued collaboration between the EU and the US, especially in this um, increasingly challenging geopolitical environment, um, and especially following Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, uh, but also what the EU terms as the growing systemic rivalry and competition with China. Uh, and I see this um, a conversation as well set against an approach that sees China I think for its part, signaling several competing uh, objectives here in Europe regarding the ongoing war, um, for instance, calling for an end to hostilities in Ukraine, but uh, at the same time remaining um, and maintaining a close strategic partnership with um, Russia. But I think that following uh, Lulea and um, um, the meeting in Sweden, there are still a couple of critical questions that need to be asked to assess the strength uh, of the commitment under the TTC. Um, how should the TTC and the EU US relationship address these geopolitical and economic challenges posed by Russia and other actors? Um, and as well as uh, what the joint statement refers to non-market policies and practices that seek to disrupt US uh, and EU economic, political and technological uh, interests. And of course, the key question also for our discussion uh, today, uh, whether the TTC has delivered enough across its 10 working groups and what are the next steps and future deliverables in the TTC process. Um, as a caveat, I would say that um, uh, the strength of the TTC process is also highly dependent um, on what will be coming in 2024, as both the EU and the United States will enter major election cycles that will um, occur next year. And uh, from this perspective, this uh, will potentially uh, shift um, um, priorities, also pushing uh, both parties to have more of an inward uh, um, gaze and reflection. Uh, so from uh, this point of view, there is a strong need to accelerate actually the TTC agenda, um, uh, also knowing um, uh, that domestic political factors may soon potentially disrupt this process. Uh, but uh, importantly, um, uh, and uh, to close more the geopolitical uh, reflection, the, the TTC last year was 
spurred by the need to cooperate on sanctions and export controls after Russia's um, invasion of Ukraine. Um, and this has been also critical when it comes to technology. Um, however, I also share uh, the views of my fellow panelists in the fact that concrete progress from the TTC uh, has long been hindered by uh, what I would call persistent frictions about uh, trade policy climate, uh, but also more the value based conversations related to our uh, to, to respective um, uh, uh, world uh, views, but also understandings of what, for instance, trustworthy artificial intelligence might mean. Uh, but in terms of more the trade areas, indeed, the IRA or uh, electric vehicle tax credit and the European Union's carbon border adjustment mechanism, mechanism the CBM, um, I would see these, um, uh, for instance, for the last year, ministerial as key frictions. Um, and uh, with this uh, fourth meeting, um, uh, it seems that these frictions have subsided and um, they are paving the way for what could be labeled as a more fruitful conversation on a technology-centered TTC. So, uh, in this respect, I think that this comes also um, following the G7 summit in Hiroshima um, and uh, how some of the more geopolitical dynamics of um, economic statecraft and great power competition um, also dominated this TTC ministerial. And here I would like to highlight uh, uh, discussions on screening mechanisms, expert controls, issues related to economic coercion, and of course, uh, what has been already mentioned, um, uh, the concept of de-risking through di diplomacy. Uh, but maybe just to highlight three uh, striking results, um, I would say that advancements were made uh, when it comes to convergence around key technologies like uh, 5G, quantum computing, and artificial intelligence, which I think uh, featured prominently on the agenda uh, discussions. Uh, this, I would say, sh showcases the fact that both parties are actually willing to cooperate and push the agenda forward on joint action in these uh, three critical domains uh, that are uh, um, the backbone as well of uh, the so-called fourth industrial revolution. Uh, so uh, cooperation um, on critical emerging technology matters uh, was high on the priority agenda, as already mentioned, and I think that significant attention was given to questions of regulation of emerging technologies, uh, especially quantum and AI. Uh, and related to AI, also discussions uh, surrounding uh, the recent hype uh, um, uh, related to generative uh, AI systems. Uh, so uh, first, when it comes to um, AI and the joint roadmap for trust with AI and risk management, um, I think that from this perspective, um, the ministerial announced that they have reached their previously stated goals of creating these three new expert working groups. These were already mentioned um, and also um, uh, they have already begun to produce tangible results um, with the release of uh, 65 key shared terms relevant to a risk-based approach to AI. Um, alongside also with the uh, mapping of US and EU standardization activities, um, again, to find uh, areas uh, of common ground. Um, and I believe that since its beginning, the TTC and especially through the working group, first working group and its AI subgroup has focused on identifying common priorities and aligning governing principles for artificial intelligence based on a very important uh, concept here in Brussels, namely trustworthiness. Um, um, and with the caveat that both parties uh, still define or see differently this concept um, um, at home. So both the US and the EU have sought to build an ongoing domestic effort to frame the development of these AI tools and services also related to how they potentially may, uh, they might uh, disrupt the labor, uh, labor for the labor force but um, specifically when it comes to trustworthiness, I think that this is an uh, ongoing conversation, especially surrounding the AI Act that aims to implement these harmonized rules on different risk-based categories of AI systems uh, and to push forward a human-centric and trustworthy 
um, a trustworthy approach. Um, and just uh, as, a, as, a, as some good news to share, Today, the European Parliament achieved a majority voting on the AI Act proposal, which marks, uh, I would say, a significant step towards the Parliament Council and Commission trilogues um, coming next. But now, uh, maybe moving to the second point and some advances made as well uh, with the, the creation of a new joint task, work, uh, task, task force on quantum technologies. And I think that this is also expected to feed into US uh, and EU. Uh, cyber, the EU-US cyber dialogue, uh, especially with a focus uh, on including uh, property rights, yet again defining standards for uh, quantum computers, also issues related to export controls and importantly post-quantum cryptography. Uh, which um, I think that are productive areas where uh, both uh, parties can cooperate, uh, especially when it comes to their research, respective research and development programs. Um, and uh, third, uh, the 6G outlook, um, and again, resulting from uh, discussions, I believe, in previous TTC meetings, uh, 6G workshop convened by both governments uh, this spring uh, in April, uh, I think, um, fed into valuable uh, recommendations for this ministerial, um, which uh, actually includes uh, a newly created 6G outlook. Uh, and uh, the idea is here again to establish uh, principles for future development, including sustainability, security, and um, access. Um, there are other areas, but I will not go into detail, but maybe importantly, conversations surrounding generative AI programs such, such as ChatGPT, uh, I think, have further propelled um, um, uh, the need for convergence and cooperation, uh, especially uh, with regard to ethical issues. Um, and these ethical uh, issues to become the, uh, the uh, to become a priority and um, um, a priority of policymaking, uh, especially in recent months across uh, the Atlantic. And uh, to quote here, uh, the, the, objective, the objective is to mitigate the risk of extin extinction. <laughs> the, uh, the existential questions here uh, that were already uh, raised, um, uh, the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war. So I think that uh, by emphasizing um, this view uh, on uh, such systems, um, um, the, the meeting established uh, the importance of um, discussing further uh, pod rails and rules uh, of, the ro of uh, how to, for instance, uh, govern generative AI. Uh, overall, I would say that um, such conversations uh, at, at this point um, um, are more limited to non-binding standards and codes of conduct around transparency, risk audits, and other technical details from companies developing the technology, uh, which I believe this will be presented to leaders of the G7 as a joint transatlantic proposal in the fall. But, um, I think that in this regard, the TTC faces a dilemma, and this will be my last point. Um, I think that uh, it's true that this, this body, this forum is most suited to address digital and emerging technology policy issues that do not require major changes in domestic regulation. But I think that regulatory concerns are actually precisely what uh, stakeholders should address during um, this conversation. So during the next months, the TTC must keep uh, its forward-looking gaze, especially when it comes to generative AI, but also uh, I would say take a step further to address challenging regulatory issues uh, and also uh, issues related to oversight. Um, but yeah, I will stop here and looking forward to the discussion um, later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Riluka. Um, as you've already uh, touched upon, the fourth DTC meeting uh, covered a number of teams. So I propose that we now uh, zoom in on, on some of them. Um, and on emerging technologies, uh, you already uh, mentioned a joint roadmap on evaluation and measurement tools for thirstworthy um, artificial intelligence, as well as the work of the expert groups on defining uh, key AI terms, mapping EU and US involvement in uh, standardization activities, and the special focus now on generative AI. 
And on top of this, now uh, there was the announcement of the new code of conduct on AI, which, which will have a draft um, in, in a few weeks um, to come out uh, to the public. And perhaps reversing the, the, the order and starting with uh, Waluka now, um, what is the significance of these initiatives on AI? And how do they relate to the ongoing uh, pr procedure over the EU Draft AI Act? Because it continues, of course, to, to move through the legislative procedure while these discussions in the DTC are happening. Yes, thank you so much for this question. Um, yeah, it's a complex and layered question at the same time. Um, I think that uh, the joint roadmap is um, a good way to go about it in terms of um, addressing all the key three critical areas, uh, definitions, taxonomy, uh, and so on. And I was just browsing through the Q&A and already some of the issues that I wanted to raise are preempted there in the questions from the audience. But um, I think that um, one of the key takeaways from the TTC is that the UN and the United States have agreed on the need to prevent AI from eroding democratic values. Uh, and here, I think the main emphasis should be as well on uh, respecting fundamental rights, but also, as I mentioned, um, related to regulation uh, and binding regulation to be based um, on, of course, on a risk management uh, framework. And I, I, I would say that, yes, on the superficial level, um, these efforts uh, within the discussions and ministerial meetings have uh, contributed to a gradual convergence of the UN and US views on AI especially in particular the UN and US agree um, again um, on the democratic and human rights angle um, and the establishment of a transatlantic trust where the AI area will be important also for the UN and the United States to demonstrate the benefits of lawful and democratically governed AI uh, versus uh, authoritarian models that um, compromise for instance individual rights and freedoms uh, and I think that um, uh, despite these remarkable efforts from both sides uh, to, I, I don't know, reconcile different uh, views and regulatory cultures uh, as well by building um, cooperation on the ground up, the roadmap also indicates how far there is to go to actually make transatlantic cooperation truly concrete and actually uh, effective. So in this regard, achieving interoperable definitions of basic terms, again, including uh, terms and concepts such as trustworthiness, risk, harm, bias, robustness, and safety. Uh, but yes, this is only an initial step, uh, a step and uh, let's see uh, what ne the next steps will bring about. So yeah, maybe I'll stop here. Thank you. Stefan, uh, as a dear, what, do, what is the significance of uh, the DTC initiatives on, on AI for both parties, or for the United States and Europe? No, no. First of all, I I, I agree very much uh, with Ruta at uh, what she's what she just said. Actually, in terms of um, an overall commitment by both sides uh, to address. Um, this issue and of course this voluntary code of conduct um, designed to bring to prevent harm including from from the most advanced uh, AI technology known as generative uh, AI like open AI so chat GPT etc and Google's uh, BART uh, um, I, I think uh, certainly um, is of course an issue that has very much taken the the public on both sides, particularly on on the European side. Um, uh, yeah, I, I would actually say by by storm, triggering hopes as well as anxieties uh, uh, for the future of humanity and democracy, as as, as as has been said. But I think particularly on that issue, and nevertheless, we have to wait and see uh, if it comes to um, implementation, if it comes to the rules, uh, agreeing on the rules. I think uh, there remains a massive AI-shaped divide, what I would call AI divide between Washington and Brussels, um, particularly on the rules. Um, the EU, we all know, of course, 
bolstered by a track record of writing much of the digital uh, rule book uh, that now dominates pretty much the Western world is moving ahead with mandatory rules, uh, uh, as we all know, and, and uh, for artificial intelligence that would require firms to, to not use the technology in predefined harmful, as commission says, um, ways. By the end of December, uh, European officials hope to com 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 complete the EU's uh, AI Act. Uh, let's see uh, what the, how that will look like uh, after tough political negotiations, of course, among the member states uh, that have dragged on for over two years now, by the way. Um, and, um, and I think this effort alone has already led the US industry, which is investing billions of dollars, as we all know, um, into AI to keep its eyes on the EU for concrete legislation, uh, much like what happened when the bloc started making laws on privacy and online content rules. So that is, I think that will be the crucial uh, point actually, and uh, because we know that the U.S. nevertheless, um, on 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 the other hand, prefers a way more hands-off approach, as it's usually called by by experts and scholars working on that issue, relying on industry to come come up with its own safeguards. So ongoing political divisions within Congress also make it unlikely any AI specific legislation will be passed before next year's US election. That's my 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 guess. I think maybe Alistair can add more to that. I'm, I'm, happy to hear to, to hear more about that um so i think uh, it will be a very very contentious issue and i think the current administration in washington has made international collaboration on ai uh, very much a policy priority that's certainly true especially because the majority of the leading ai companies like google microsoft and OpenAI are headquartered in the us um, um, and basically their main intention is of course that they want and here China comes in again, they want that these companies can compete against China's uh, rivals. Uh, uh, and uh, as a, which is very much as we all know, a national security priority. Um, so I think this is, uh, that will somehow play into all the debates and discussions. And I nevertheless think that this, this will be a hard issue to, um, and, 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 and a very contentious issue among the allies. Would you also like to comment on the AI initiatives? Well, yes, um, speaking, speaking third, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase uh, the late Congressman Mo Udall by saying everything has been said, but it's not been said by me. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, the, so the, I mean, I, I think what I'll do is I'll sort of pick up on a, a couple of things that um, the excellent comments by Rakula and Stefano. So I think, you know, as Rakula emphasized, there is this agreement on what we don't want AI to be, right? That says the, the need to protect democracy and human rights. And that is, as I alluded to in my comments, that's, that's sort of the baseline for agreement. I don't think they're gonna be able to go much beyond, right? Because as, as both of my, my panelists have stressed, there are very different political processes and you know going on in the two jurisdictions with the Europeans being way out in front um, on AI with uh, as Rick will mention the Parliament adopting its version of the AI Act um, um, and as uh, Stefan indicated there's no prospect of the US Congress adopting um, legislation on AI there's an argument being made by some in the administration um, through the uh, Federal Trade Commission that the US already has the regulatory tools necessary to address aspects of AI, particularly with respect to, to um, competition issues and um, bias, uh, whether they're correct or not, some of the story, but the, I mean, so there's a claim, right? but it's a completely different approach to what the Europeans are doing. As the US and the EU tend to take very different approaches, I mean, the EU process, even where they are regulating the same things in the same way, you know, with the same objectives, that does not happen. The EU does it through legislation, the US does it through regulation, and you get differences. And I think those differences are just going, are going to um, become more acute and more problematic as the 
legislative or regulatory processes roll out in the future. The TTC is not designed to handle that. And it, it has no prospect of handling it. Right? Um, it's not intended to do it. It's not designed to do it. All they're trying to do is hope by, you know, through establishing this baseline to, to mitigate the degree of difference to an extent, but that hinges entirely on how much those common understandings agreed in the TTC are then fed into the domestic processes. And that's a huge uh, question. Um, I thought there was something else I was going to say, but I'm, I'm, I can't remember what it is. Maybe I'll come back in front of it. But, we can but, we can move on to the next topic and then you can if you remember your your point you can we can come back to that uh but in the in the opening statements and i also see a question in the chat that uh, mentions the disagreement between the eu and the us regarding the inflation reduction act so perhaps to to touch on that is this disagreement now officially and permanently resolved or does the solution that was reached by the parties and that is mentioned in, in the in the joint statement, does it leave space for, for future disputes or is it, in a sense, what do you make of, of this solution? Well, I go first. I, my understanding is that there isn't a full agreement in place and the tension is between um, what we admit, I mean, partially it's, has to do with the, the, you know, the US issues about what counts as a free trade agreement. Because right? that's the, the way they're trying to, the hope is to have this agreement between the EU and the US that will be count as a free trade agreement and thus enable EU companies to benefit from the carve out for treatment of firms from countries with which the US has a free trade agreement which apparently was all based on a misunderstanding and not realizing the US and the EU didn't have a free trade agreement, but there you go. Um, and so the, the challenge is the more formal the agreement, to make the agreement formal enough to placate Congress that it's a free trade agreement then makes Congress think, well, if it's a free trade agreement, then we should ratify it. So the administration is kind of caught in this um, situation. And, and so the, that's there's a I think there is a a will to resolve it um and but the technicalities of how to make it work to actually solve the problem are non-trivial and and on that note um one of the other uh, key areas of um, the TTC was uh, some agreements on what they call security and economic uh, prosperity in trade statement. And here we have a cooperation on export controls, investment screening, um, addressing non-market policies and practices and economic coercion, as well as cooperation on non-proliferation of weapons of mass disruption. So um, how is transatlantic cooperate, uh, cooperation evolving in this, these difficult areas? And what is the impact of, of these commitments? And perhaps starting with Stefan or Rob, we'll look at Yes, it. OK. Um, I would actually like to add one more thing to, to what we just the, on the IRA. I, I pretty much agree on what is what Alice just said on uh, how to overcome irritants and, and, and how to settle disputes such as, uh, you know, over the IRA. I think um, TTC and uh, recent debates and discussions um, showed that there's a strong case actually for trying to settle disputes like, like the one over the IRA. Uh, without going to the WTO, <laughs> let me put it this way, and then uh, meaning uh, by just okay, tough bargaining uh, and tit for tat or whatever you want to call it, but it's crucial that the two parties building on the frequent meetings also of the working groups um, adopt and I think an, an, an I don't know some called it I, I one call it called it an avoid and resolve spirit with it with the with the intent to anticipate and diffuse potential irritants. 
uh, and uh, whether in relation to domestic actions, common challenges such as you know clean steel production or autonomous trade measures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think that is uh, very important, and I think uh, that's uh, that's one um, lesson we learned uh, from the recent debates. I think we pretty much, I wouldn't say we have completely sol solved the problem, but uh, I think um, in, a, in a good spirit, we, we somehow actually could overcome um, let's say worst objections uh, in, 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 in throughout Europe uh, on, with regard to the IRA, uh, which by the way, as a matter of fact, I think, uh, but I don't want to go into in detail here. I think um, it was just, I, I, I always try to re remind my European colleagues here that uh, look at, uh, you know, all these subsidies and, 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 and all the money we, 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 actually thrown into 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 green technology uh, now we finally have uh, the biden aspiration and the us uh, to do exactly what we expected them to do or have been expecting them to do for for years so uh, we have to stand this competition as a matter of fact uh, i would say so coming to your to the other question actually um, uh, inbound in investment screening and, and and outbound investment screening also related, of course, to the um, to um, uh, the idea to um, uh, and, and how to 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 deal, how to coordinate with third countries to counter evasion of, let's say, export restrictions and sensitive uh, items and issues, so all against the background of uh, the current war in in, in Ukraine. Uh, I think. Um, it's quite interesting to see. We know that, with particular with regard to outbound, outbound uh, investment screening, it, uh, the U.S. took initial steps and uh, once again took the lead to address the national security threats emanating from outbound uh, investment from the U.S. in certain sectors critical for U.S. national security, uh, and uh, identify the, the the resources that would be required to establish and implement such a screening program. The U.S. The EU, meanwhile, is also looking uh, at developing a similar um, screening process. Uh, I think that's quite interesting, though there are still some member states who are, of course, are quite skeptical about that. Uh, but uh, there is a trend, actually, in these days uh, that, particularly with regard to China, as a matter of fact, uh, Europe has finally uh, uh, realized that geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, uh, challenges do uh, are intertwined, actually, and uh, cannot be separate from each other. And I think uh, that's important. And uh, the TTC recognized that addressing outbound investment concerns could be important to complement existing uh, um, tools of con controls on experts and inbound investments. And to that end, the TTC, uh, TTC, I think, will be working also in the future on a, a more coordinated response uh, to, to outbound investment concerns pertaining to national security. I think that's something the European Union slowly but incrementally is realizing, becoming aware of. Um, yes, completely agree with <laughs> this uh, outlook. And maybe just to add a couple of points um, related as well to perceptions, um, 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 what I call civil military again dynamics and what China has put forward with the military civil fusion, especially when it comes to this outboard investment screening and trying to understand as well how certain technologies then trickle down or up the, the market streams. And I think that's highly important, especially when it comes to critical technological um, domains that are again the backbone of uh, the digital transformation at the same time and of course the, um, uh, the case of uh, semiconductors is very well known in this regard um, but I would also add here um, one um, dimension I think to the discussion especially when it comes to technologies the technologies themselves um, and um, I think that um, there is a need or at, le at least the TTC has reached the point of uh, a sense of a shared external threat or challenge, especially when it comes to perceptions on technology, especially general purpose technologies, but also technologies that I, um, um, I see as dual use technologies. Um, and uh, here again, we can discuss about quantum cap capabilities, um, uh, AI tools, but I think that 
um, in addition to the dual use nature of emerging technologies, uh, there is a need, um, and this uh, this need was also recognized uh, within the DTC TTC format. Uh, there is a need to diversify global supply chains. Um, especially when it comes to controlling the acquisition of strategic applications of fundamental technologies. So here is more of a conversation about broader technology policy uh, and again, um, how um, a shared vision of um, how the digital future or the technological future, uh, future plays out also in the transatlantic uh, context. I, I see that we have quite a number of questions from, from our audience members. So I'll perhaps go straight to that. And we have two questions on the future of the TTC, um, specifically regarding the upcoming elections in, in the US. So how could the election results affect the work of the TTC and transatlantic cooperation? And will the TTC endure um, if um, the executive and legislative composition in the US changes? And perhaps we'll, we'll start with uh, LSD for this one. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I don't, the legislature composition is irrelevant. This is an executive level activity. So you know, whether control of Congress changes that won't change that. Um, if um, the next president of the United States is Donald Trump again, um, then the TCC is dead. Um, he'll have no interest in it, there'll be no political support for it. Um, that doesn't mean that the effects of the TTC will be dead, um, because one of the things it's done has fostered um, official to official level cooperation on issues that of shared interest. So things like, you know, the US and the EU will continue to coordinate on export controls and investment screening, even if the administration changes. Um, so that's, and so so at some level, some of the effects of the TTC and some of the things that it has started may well continue to go. It will not have, it will not continue to exist in the current form. It will not have the same level of uh, political support. And what it does will be, um, you know, much more based on, on where the interests of officials on both sides lie. The other, aspect which actually plays into um, what I was the thing I forgot to say is that I think that the, the transatlantic relationship will become much more conflictual um, not just because because of Trump but the thing is that the Biden administration is not necessarily unhappy with the EU's regulation of technology. Right, because as was alluded to, it affects American firms and therefore they change their practices in the US and, and as well and in ways that the Biden administration is quite happy with. The Trump administration would not be happy with those. And so those issues are much more, so you know, the, the discussions of, of, of irritants, part of it is the, you know, part of why they've died down is partially they've found workarounds with the IRA, but also part of it is that the Biden administration is just not we're not reacting to um, EU initiatives because it's quite all right with them. And that those things would become much more irritating to a Trump-led administration. So not only would the TTC cease to function as it is, but the issues that we've been highlighting as potential sources of friction will become much more volatile uh, and problematic for the change of administration. We're, we're getting close to, to the end of, of our webinar. So before I, um, before I pass the floor to Stefan and Maluka, I'll just uh, touch upon um, some criticisms that were mentioned by the, um, our participants and uh, some criticisms of the structure of the TTC itself in the sense that, first of all, it's, it excludes uh, parliaments completely. And then uh, another criticism that is often heard is that it's, uh, not inclusive by nature because only two regions are involved and how, for example, the OECD would be a better forum to discuss, uh, for example, AI. Um, so with these criticisms uh, in mind, and also uh, we know that the next TTC meeting will, will take place in, in six months, um, 
what are your thoughts on, on the future of, of the TTC in regards to this criticism, criticisms, but also uh, in general with, uh, with the next meeting and what would you like to, to see come out of it? Maybe I can take some, some parts of the question um, related to um, the criticism. And um, yes, if I'm not mistaken, the main, um, the main uh, criticism was that um, um, the TTC should be uh, subjected to uh, democratic scrutiny. Um, and also uh, MEPs called for the establishment of, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly uh, the term, but I think it's a committee or subcommittee on trade and technology council uh, within the transatlantic legislators uh, dialogue, uh, as well as um, uh, to include other uh, stakeholders um, to also have outreach to uh, relevant stakeholders at uh, parliamentary level, especially when it comes to conversations related to the green and digital transition. Um, and I think that this points to broader conversations, of course, about democratic legitimacy <laughs> and um, um, executive versus parliamentary driven um, agendas. But um, I think the broader conversation should be had as well in terms of uh, public perception and representation and how these uh, discussions are then reflected in uh, um, other uh, less high level forums. Um, and um, I think that from this regard, um, there is value added in uh, trying to leverage existing formats like, like this uh, transatlantic legislators dialogue um, and involve multiple voices and perspective in the process, maybe not in the forum itself, but also in terms of leveraging uh, some of these views um, as well around the table. So yes, um, I think that around the TTC, there are a couple of workshops and forums and conversations that involve civil society, uh, academia, think tanks and so on, of which I also be, I've been part of. Um, but um, there is an importance, I think, of uh, bringing democracy and scrutiny and oversight into the conversation, especially as a very important question uh, related to the EU's institutional landscape as well. Stefan, your final okay. thoughts? Final sword, yeah, maybe I take the, the second part of the criticism that was related to actually reaching out to others um, and then include others. And I think we, we've we mentioned it and briefly touched upon that issue. And I think it's extremely relevant. Of course, enlarging the circle of, of let's say, like-minded countries is exactly what we're currently, you know, observing and watching almost every day, you know, G7, G20, we are inviting, of course, other emerging countries, those, you know, who are still not really, who are quite ambivalent with regard to their position between, let's say, us and, 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 uh, and, 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 and China, and China's take, particularly on the Russian war, this is exactly what we're what we're witnessing right now. So I think in areas uh, in, in key areas of geopolitical and economic competition, uh, which has become much tougher as a as a matter of fact, uh, um, um, such as critical minerals also and export controls, I think the TTC really could aim to achieve and reach out to to others. Uh, and it's interesting to see that currently it's again mainly the US driving the shift to these kind of what I would call mini literal mini lateral formats in the Pacific economic framework, the the chip four, the quad uh, and 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 the US J Japan economic two plus two. Uh, and by contrast, the EU, though fully engaged uh, in the TTC, is still very much using its, yeah, well, how can you say, tried and tested massive of free trade agreement negotiations um, to engage fast growing economies that could provide alternatives, let's say, to Chinese inputs. And so here, differing approaches um, will lead to, I think, or could lead to inefficiencies over time. And, and uh, so some transatlantic coordination on that issue is uh, warranted. Let me add, stop here at that point. <laughs> and your final thoughts, as Lydia? Uh, so, I mean, and on the, the democracy point, I mean, the, the, <clears throat> to a significant extent, the, the TTC is focused on coordination um, and understanding. So it's a very executive level 
activity. I mean, it's about policy implementation and implementing policy better. It's not about, you know, as I said, it is explicitly not about trying to resolve fundamental differences, about trying to identify what can we agree on. And any agreements that they reach in terms of values um, don't have any standing until and unless they are translated into domestic legislation in each jurisdiction in which there will be a full democratic process. <laughs> so, you know, to an extent, I mean, I would be shocked if the parliament didn't call for greater involvement of parliament because that's what institutions do, right? <laughs> but I'm not sure that that's, you know, I'm not given the limited ambition of the TTC, I'm, and I'm not particularly exercised about the, uh, uh, about the lack of parliamentary oversight. In terms of engagement with others, I mean, part of my point is what's striking is this time, there is much more engagement by the EU and the US. They're you know, looking out, but you know, they, you know, the problem is the more actors you have involved, the more interest you have involved, and the harder it is to reach agreement, right? So kind of, I, you know, I think there is part of what the TTC is being used as, is as a place where the US and the EU can try and set the agenda for the G7, for the OECD on the issues. But if the, if the US and the EU can't agree on something, then you're not going to get agreement in the OECD or in the G7. So to some extent, it makes sense to start there. And it's also a reflection that they are the two most significant liberal markets. And therefore, what they can agree amongst themselves will kind of become default positions, right? Well, obviously, the more they can engage other actors, you know, but it's like, I mean, the TTC is part of a, an ecosystem that, that um, you know, Stefan was alluding to, you know, with mini laterals and different cooperation, all sorts of different forms. The TTC is just part of that. It is not uh, the only game in town by any means. Um, so I think there is quite a lot, you know, it's an additional forum, not, um, and that I don't think there's any attempt to make it the forum. It's just, an attempt to you there is a desire to use it to help set the agendas in other forms well thank you very much these are all very interesting uh, perspectives unfortunately that is all the time that we have for today so i'd like to thank you um thank our speakers very much for this interesting discussion and i would also like to thank our audience uh, for taking part in, in the webinar if you'd like to know more about the America Europe Fund, our upcoming events, or watch recording, recordings of past events, you can do so on our website, which is america-europefund.eu. So thank you very much uh, for joining us today, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.